Hello there and welcome to Off Track, the official podcast of Extreme E. In this episode, we chat with Excite Energy Racing's Ollie Bennett. Joining me, I get to say this this time, my yeah. friend and yours, James Baldwin. G'day. Nice to be with you. Thank you for uh, taking the friendship into 2022. It's a beautiful thing. <laughs> for many more years, at least one more, I'd I'd love, for. Yeah. <laughs> one Hopefully. more year of friendship. Yes. And then we'll assess it. But we're joined by a new friend this week. <laughs> yes. Friend. From Excite Energy Racing, Ollie Bennett joins us. Ollie, how are you doing? Thank you, guys. Thank you for having me. I'm doing well. I feel like I'm down under at the minute. I do feel uh, <laughs> I'm, not, uh, I'm in the Northern Hemisphere right now, but it's good. Yeah. Yeah. Bringing <laughs> Australia to the UK since mm. 2021. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, we would offer you a can of Fosters, but we're going to talk about your own drink later on. That's all we can really talk about on this podcast. So, would, we, yeah. would we, though, as Australians? No, we wouldn't. No, we wouldn't. No, it Let's was be honest. Just, and you just can't a... see them on camera, but they got some beers lined up, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> we said that we weren't going to talk about this. Uh, very true. <laughs> it was a bit too silent. Look, let's talk about your story, though, first. Before we get into uh, I- Extreme E, of course, I want to know where you started with motorsport. We're used to hearing from a lot of guys starting super young. Yeah. Were you a carter when you were one and a half years old? It was super young not one and a half but no motocross i started Mm -hmm. yeah motocross bike so yeah i was quite young probably eight um much to my mum's hatred of bikes and everything that's where (laughs) that's where i started and she was glad to see the back of it but yeah it was uh i enjoyed it It was here in england rainy england in fields Mm -hmm. as a kid every weekend uh just thrashing it out so it was good fun what was it like going through school at that point because Obviously, that's probably the most exciting part, isn't it? The weekends or the weekday stuff. Did your studies suffer as a result yeah. of your <laughs> love of that? Definitely did, yeah. I mean, the school was not a fan of it. You know, calling my parents being like, he's missed Friday afternoon again. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, yeah, we had to go racing. And they were supportive of it, um, which I'm glad at looking back on the schooling system. I'm glad I took Friday off to go racing. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm here now and it worked. But uh, yeah, no, they wasn't. They weren't happy with it. And I think... Uh, yeah, it's one of those things, really. Racing was, it's, it's a niche sport, isn't it? I guess, especially mm-hmm. at that age. Um, even some of my friends were like, where are you going? Why are you not playing football on Saturday? So, yeah, it's one of those. And were you watching motorsports as a kid too? Is that part of the reason as to why you got so interested in wanting to get on a bike? Or is it literally, I just don't want to play football and do the normal thing. I want to go do the cool jumps. I, I mean, I've been interested in like cars and vehicles when I was young, like driving the lawnmower. I just, like, yeah. oh, I'm, I'm mowing the lawn because <laughs> yeah. I want to drive the lawnmower. <laughs> yeah. so it's, it's just one of those from a young age. And then, uh, yeah, just built from there and enthusiastic about it. Obviously, yeah, you start following people in motorsport, don't you? Then I was sort of following guess the biking generation which was sort of um you know travis pastrana these sorts of guys mm. following them following the x games all seeing all these cool sports and say yeah, i'm just going to do that so that's where it went really it's pretty cool is it hard to convince parents on bikes i know motorsport sometimes is a hard sell and even my brother when he started motorcycle riding was told off by my parents and he was 25 at the time <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so as a, as a young child how does that conversation it go? was tricky i mean i had my dad fortunately he ra- rode bikes when he was younger mm-hmm. so he was all four he's like yeah let's just do it of course convincing mum that was harder but she i sort of persuaded her around even at a young age uh you know sort of negotiation skills came out at eight and i was like look <laughs> if you let me ride a motocross bike i'll never have a road bike so ah. that, that was my way into it and sort of smoothed her into it that way um until i started racing and then the bikes get bigger and faster and you fall off and break a few bones and she's like this needs to stop <laughs> and she realizes that the road bike actually would have been a safer thing all, <laughs> all along probably yeah and i've ended up with a road bike so yeah well there you go funny story <laughs> i didn't keep my promises so you've reneged you've reneged uh, dear me I what? Said good negotiating bad bad liar i've said no but yeah. we well that could be good negotiating isn't yeah, it, it you get be. what you want you got what you wanted yeah exactly. the negotiation was a great success <laughs> Successful. i think that's fine yeah. stepping into competition though from from bike riding how does that how did that come about in terms of competing on bikes, mm. that I think I think you just end up like any sport you like as a kid. I think you just the better you get at it, the more like I'm quite good at this, and you see what you can do with it. Went to some sort of junior races, very amateur to start with. Obviously, didn't really know what I was doing, and then you get better at that. You beat some people, you win a few races, you move up, and you just I think rate motorsport especially is one of those things where you just you, you sort of get as fast as the people around you and then you start beating them and then you move on to the next piece I think you keep going until you get to the point where you're like can I even beat these people or what am I even doing <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah that's the sort of way it went really was there a point where sort of imposter syndrome started to kick in at all for you so as you were saying like yeah. oh and what am I doing here did you were you ever sort of at the point where you're like yeah, yeah. Hang on a second. <laughs> a, I'm on this starting grid yeah. with all these other bikes, and I'm you're potentially in a de- you know deadly situation if everything goes wrong. Yeah. And you started having some success. Is there something that you went, 
either I need to be better at this and go away and do some training specifically around this or is it natural talent that you wanted to pursue? Like how did it, how did your mind cope? I I definitely think that's the thing. I think it probably came for me more because I was so young on bikes. I was so sort of confident in my own ignorance, I guess. That's why I've been doing this so long. (laughs) Yeah, I'm absolutely going to nail this. So uh, that's it. It was more when I got into car racing, which was later, I was 18, 19, um, sort of in university the car thing for me was more of a struggle because there was a point in time where I fell into it won sort of all my first events was just good at it which I think was from motocross really it was just a different discipline um, but I knew how to be professional in motorsport already so uh, climbed through that those ranks quite quickly then you just sort of I, was, I can remember a moment sat in Linden Hill in, in Rallycross um, probably 2015 now a few years ago just sat on the line just looking at the, I'm, uh, I'm driving against people I used to play on a Playstation when I was like 12 <laughs> wow <laughs> yeah, just, yeah. I'm looking over and uh, I can remember being sat on the line Peter Solberg I think Ken Block mm. um, Sebastian Loeb a few of these racing rally legends I'm like I play you as a kid on a Playstation I'm just about to <laughs> have a go at this green light with you and hope I get to the first corner <laughs> before you I'm like this is very surreal and I think that's definitely when you get that imposter moment you're like yeah. should I be here am I quick mm. enough can I do this and uh, then you've just got to dig deep and go for it I think were you competitive as a young guy as well? Obviously, to compete, you have to have like a competitive gene. But you, yeah. that guy, had to win in everything when you were a kid. Yeah, I think I was driven for that, and I think you need to be a certain to for a certain extent in most, but probably to keep yourself safe. I think mm-hmm. you've got to have that driven ability to be like, well, I want to win this, I want to do well, because I think if you get, especially on motocross bikes, if you're there sort of like you said wondering if probably with bikes that's why you don't get the imposter syndrome if you thought you shouldn't be there and you then you your confidence goes and you fall off it's gonna hurt yeah so the whole point is feeling like you can do it and a lot of that i find even with racing if you believe you can do it and you're sort of focused on that mindset it's surprising what you can do so yeah i think that that's part of it so when did that become a, a career option i suppose because it's really easy to start well easy enough to start off let's say and not really knowing where you're going to go yeah. at some point that commitment has to be made right tell yeah. us talk us through that that moment where motorsport was going to be the thing for you probably about the age i was 16 17 that's when my sort of professional motocross career took off that's when i was sort of winning championships and in, in, in doing well um you know in europe europe and different things that's when you can start looking at sponsorships mm-hmm. and then can you get away from that and, and all these sorts of things but i fell out of that moment then um probably more again mother again <laughs> should you do this or should you get a job and go to university on this i was like do you know what probably racing bikes the rest of my life isn't going to cut it um so i went to university sort of had a few years off racing um was in uh, done business and economics and sort of got into that life uh, but i was i was always itching for something on the weekend i wasn't really into partying all that much because i spent much of my youth on bikes on weekends um and sort of university was finishing up i was like i haven't don't know what i want to do after university but i'd love to race again and that's when the cars came into it then so i sort of fell back into it uh and now it's, it's become very quite serious it's interesting because you've sort of you had to reintegrate into a normal life in that case having decided it was going to be motorsport but then s- sounds like you sort of gave it up fundamentally yeah. for a couple of years yeah, I did, yeah. That must be an incredibly hard decision. Yeah, no, it was really tricky because it's almost like something you've done it all your life, every weekend. It's a big part of who I was and what I'd done. And I guess it's that association thing, like imposter syndrome. That's mm-hmm. why I associated with. I was at Ollie the motocross rider. Mm. Kids at school would say that. They'd be like, yeah. Oh, you gone off riding again this weekend? <laughs> but like, yeah. Um, and there's like, oh, well, I'm not doing that now. And I sort of I replaced the obsession actually um, with fitness. I was at university, but I got really heavily into fitness. Spent a lot of weekends researching fitness training, doing different type, types of fitness. Um, I'd done a nutrition degree along side that then um which was i guess replacing one spent time with another mm-hmm. um, and just carrying on that obsession in something else so yeah that's what i got a heavily diverted focus i guess and how i guess how important was that diversion because it is interesting you at that age like so that's you know uh, teenage years let's say that personality element is really important and sort of forming your idea of yourself ollie the motocross rider what were those, that specifically, let's say, that first year in university, like adjusting away from that? Because that is, I mean, at that age, thinking of my own youth, for example, that is really important. I think for me, it was, I, it, I can remember feeling almost just re- replacing obsessions for me, I think, was the way it felt. And I think, um, you know, that's probably been... Um, a trajectory through most of my life. I think I was obsessed with motocross uh, mm-hmm. initially. The university then I replaced that time with with the fitness and nutrition, um, which ultimately I'm sure we'll get onto. But that's sort of how I led back myself back into racing eventually. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, I just replaced one hobby with another obsession. I think, and I've probably done that since. It's funny how you said that. Obviously, mum 
was a big part of you following the university path. And I think for a lot of people listening and especially, I mean, other drivers as well, we know that not everyone did karting from the age of two months, you know, to, to be <laughs> the point where they're driving so regularly now. Uh, they've always been told that you need to have a backup plan and that especially the off-road world, there isn't a hell of a lot of money to go around in sponsorships and to make it a, a legitimate thing for a long time. What was the moment then that you realised that you A, you missed it, and you mentioned before that you kind of accidentally made this a real thing now. Yeah, yeah. Talk me through that process where actually whilst the economics and business degree probably helped you further along, and we'll talk, of yeah, course, yeah. about Excite in a little bit, but the moment where you actually realised it was possible to have a good crack at this and reconnect with you following your dreams path rather yeah. than just doing the traditional everyone else's role. It was a, it was a weird moment again I think, I mean you, you find your life so you have a few moments that sort of do take you off real different paths and it was sort of a 90 right for me. Um, that's a good pun there wasn't it? There you but, go. Yeah, <laughs> well done. Yeah, well yeah. done. I was waiting for something. The I've just ticked it off yeah, the bigger No, so I think for me it was, again, finishing university, I had a uh, business degree, um, economics, I knew what I was into that sort of thing, had a nutrition degree that I was um, really interested in, and I wanted to re- go racing again, basically, um, saved up a bit of money, and I bought a Group B rally car, just a, uh, it was basically like a road car Subaru with a roll cage, and thought, well, this will do, I'll just go rally this, <laughs> um, and I did, and, and I bought that car, um, in the, the summer later I'd done a rally in it and I came I think like third in my group out of four, three, four hundred cars I came like 30th or something so I was like oh, I'm, wow. I can drive the car because yeah. <laughs> I was like am I going to crash straight into the woods or how will this go um, so I had a bit of a talent for driving the car um, and I could tell that was creeping back in there and I wanted to race I wanted to be involved in motorsport again and it, it sort of grew from there really We've spoken to a couple of drivers who started on bikes and then have come across to cars, which I feel like is an easier path than going from cars and then going to bikes. <laughs> but what for you, what were the major differences? What did you have to relearn in terms of speed and approach to corners and all that sort of other stuff? Obviously, it's very different, but changing yeah. your mindset's probably important. Well, you definitely can't go back because I tried that <laughs> a year ago and broke my leg. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> so that's I can definitely good. say you yeah. can't, you can't yes. go back. Trust me, the body's just not capable. Um, <laughs> but yeah, coming through, I think the main, the main thing you learn, and I'm, I'm sure it's going to help me in this sort of circuit, mm. is how to read the road because I think bikes is so important you know where you're going and what you're doing. Mm. And a lot of it, people don't realise when you drive, where you look, you tend to go and it's something you learn really quickly on a bike because if you look over there, you're crashing into whatever is over there <laughs> and you quickly pick up when you're young. All right, if I look over there, the bike's going to go that way and I think that's the biggest thing you learn quickly. Um, but what's helped me most probably later racing in rallycross, which is the discipline I, I sort of race in mostly, mm. um, was really just a spatial awareness on a start grid because I was used to launching with 30 bikes mm-hmm. and all trying to get around a little first corner and your handlebar on handlebar so you, you know, you could, you're risking your life really in those situations yeah. and I think that helped me massively in rallycross. I'm known for having great starts, which is important and that was from the biking i think that's where it really helped me through that point so how did you get from a subaru group group b rally car which and congratulations on not crashing that on your first time out honestly it's like <laughs> crashed on the second time <laughs> <laughs> as long as it's not the first time that's, that's the important thing that's, yeah. most, that's right. like 90 percent success yes. right? <laughs> yeah well did i go a third time that's the question <laughs> down to 35 though but rally cross is i mean it's an amazing sport to watch absolutely uh, but it's obviously very different from WRC and of course it's that you know idea of being in a, a pack of cars where I mean it's very heavy contact isn't it compared to a lot of other sports talk us through the process of getting from your group B rally car then into rally cross yeah yeah I mean that one it took a little longer to figure out how to get up to that point because I think rally cross is, is expensive basically mm-hmm. um, they're high performance cars short course track race and it's not like you couldn't just go and buy your own car and just go yeah. out. It, was, it was a lot of money so it, this is where it all for me sort of sort of came together I'd, get, I'd give rallying a go um, done nine events done very well in the all. I think I crashed in two there was one I got stuck in Scotland in the snow for like nine hours and that really, <laughs> oh, that, that that's really annoyed me yeah. um, I was going to say something in Australia then but <laughs> <laughs> kept it subdued so yeah. at that point I was like I just, I'm not doing this anymore the trees hurt and they, f- mm. they come up past quite quickly so I thought what else can I do I love racing cars I want to race cars and I just I sort of just came across rallycross somewhere I was like wow this is like motocross but in a car basically yeah. I was like this is perfect this is exactly what I can do um, so I started thinking well how do I do it what do I do went to a car show where there was a rallycross car on display with this energy drink I've never heard of I can't even think what it's called now um, 
it, anyway, it was like something that was on the side of this car. Mm. I was like, oh, I've got an idea. <laughs> I love nutrition. I know loads about energy drinks. I know they're unhealthy. I was like, I'm going to make an energy drink, um, start a business basically in something I understood, and then sponsor myself to drive cars. So that was sort of how it all, it, it's an interesting story because Excite and yeah. the rallying, it all started together out of one ambition to, to do rally cross basically. Um, and it worked somewhere. It just started working and <laughs> we ended up, as I said, that, that was that imposter syndrome moment in this yeah. supercar um, on a racetrack. I remember the first day I drove a supercar Everyone was like, can you drive this? I was like, oh, I'm not sure. I, <laughs> I, I, we'll it's, find I, I was like, yeah. it's one way to find out. We'll do yeah. a lap of this track. Um, I mean, it's, I don't even think I've ever drove a 600 horsepower car and it was four wheel drivers. I don't mm. know what that feels like. I'm sure it's going to be great. <laughs> so, blind confidence again, went out and done a few laps. In the, I can remember the, um, the guy who was marshalling came in. He's like, wow, like, it's your first guy. I was like, yeah, he's like, we've seen some really good people drive around here. And then he was like, you look really good. I was like, well, we've got it here then. <laughs> I was like, here we go, we're lucky. So that's how it, was, it sort of all just happened around that moment, which is, yeah, quite quite amazing. It's interesting that at what was a pivotal moment, deciding to move back towards Rallycross, you decided to do a whole bunch of things at once mm. all of a sudden. What is a transition moment? Is that is that like a mentality thing? You, sometimes you start a project and you want to do all of the projects at once because it's exciting. And what was that that first year like I guess yeah. trying to set up all those things it was it was tough I can just remember thinking back and thinking right how, how do we do this and yeah. I was sort of right, thinking you know a plan out in my head and I was I was like well you know I'm, I'm, I can see a gap in the energy drink market firstly mm-hmm. so I thought there is a good idea here second I was like Red Bull are never going to sponsor me because I never drove a car before so mm-hmm. I can't go and ask them for a load of money <laughs> um, and it, they just seemed the typical businesses that would sponsor this sort yeah. of thing so one fell into another. I started researching the drink. Obviously, that took about two years to come up with the drink formulations mm. and, and actually work that bit out and start the business um, and see if it was possible. So that was the first thing that I started, pushed down that angle. As that got bigger and started to work um, and, and needed marketing, then it, it sort of went perfect hand in hand. And it was like, I want to drive cars. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it just perfectly fit together, really. Tell us about developing an energy drink. Mm. Because, I mean, you, did have, you obviously have the background for it, which is yeah. a great bonus, but... It is pretty dramatically removed from racing. What? Where do you start when you want to design something like yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, like you said, I had an understanding of ingredients and nutrition. Mm. I knew what was good and bad for you. So I, mm. I had basic understanding. But then, yeah, how do you make a drink fizzy? How do you get it in a can? How many cans have you got to buy? <laughs> like, how do you print on a can? Um, you know, all the things you think, and how do you make it safe? It doesn't kill anyone. Like, it's all the <laughs> things you're thinking, like, is this even possible? And I think I was just obsessed again, just sitting there mm-hmm. Googling, energy drink co-packers energy drink suppliers how do you make an energy drink finding consultants that knew how to make it google coca-cola people and then be like do you want to help me yeah um, and just going for it really and just really pushing deep in that and uh yeah surprising when you focus on something like that it's surprising what you can do and who will help you mm. um with the right idea so yeah it was just a year or two probably a year i would say of just in my room just researching and ringing people and trying to get people to help so and it was obviously driving you because you wanted to sponsor yourself, right? Yeah, so I wanted you're like, to, race oh, the to get my sponsor. I need <laughs> yeah. myself to be successful, <laughs> yeah, so yeah. I will put the work in. Yeah, it must exactly be easy right. to negotiate that sponsorship, right? Well, it is, <laughs> it is now. It is now. I mean, we're launching uh, the the drink will be launched in America soon, and mm-hmm. you know, you need cars in America. So, <laughs> yes, which you've been doing, which yeah. has been yeah, fantastic which has been good, to yeah, watch really as well. well. How quickly does it get boring tasting samples of your drink when you're setting it up? When you're trying mm. to find the right flavor? I is mean. It, the, the sampling bit's quite fun. The mm. the riskiest bit, we, I've had drinks before. There's a funny thing in drink science. About eight to ten weeks after you've produced is what they will taste like. So mm. what you're sampling on day one is not the drink. And we've had some... We've had a lot of cans in eight to ten weeks not taste how they should. I'll tell you that. <laughs> and then you've got to start again. So I think that's been... Uh, that, that, those are the learning curves I think you go through. Um, and I, you, you think even sometimes you're like, Fuck, can you even do this? Like, should we stop? Um, is this right? And, and there's been many moments I think people probably have it as athletes thinking, you know, should I stop there? Is that my limit? Mm-hmm. Um, and then you push a bit harder and, and you go again. So, yeah, we've had some funny moments. Obviously, people can buy the drink and taste for themselves. Yeah. But... In your head, does it taste like something you wanted to taste like originally? Or does it end up being a compromise of like, well, it's got to have the good stuff in it and this kind of stuff? Yeah. Does it taste like your drink is what mm. I really want to ask? It's a good question. I think you go you go at it with ideals mm. and then you always come back from that, I think. And um, I think 
taste is a is a very tricky thing for us. We we wanted it to be zero sugar. Mm-hmm. Um, we wanted no colorings, no preservatives. So we was taking out a lot of stuff that inherently helps shelf life mm-hmm. and taste mm-hmm. and texture and mouthfeel and all the things you get. Um, that's what took the 12 months really. And, and we had to go through different formulations and specialists to try and get that. And it's something that we get sort of prided on now, especially with buyers. We give them, oh, it doesn't have, a lot of the time people say, oh, it doesn't have that sickly mouthfeel. Yeah. doesn't leave your tongue feeling funny. None of that's accident it's all just ages of testing and formulations to try and do that so um, and then of course the flavouring part it comes separate it's do you want raspberries or strawberries and, <laughs> and then you go down all those sort of things um, but yeah it's quite an interesting process it's exciting to be able to use the word mouthfeel in a conversation though like that's yes. how often is that going to happen this podcast is now leaning towards <laughs> yeah we've gone what's off drink mouthfeel? tasting yeah. we've gone what? off the subject there yes. haven't we what's the mouthfeel <laughs> of this podcast though <clears throat> how would you describe the mouthfeel of uh, XE off track Australian <laughs> yeah <laughs> and whatever connotations that comes to your mind yes. as a result of that. I, I love it. I like the Australian thing. I get like a warm, like I'm in a warm climate, but I'm definitely not. Yes, yes probably because the heat is on. <laughs> the I heat think is very high. Yeah, yeah, we should uh, there you go. We tried to make it feel Australian. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. amazing. It's a good old Aussie down under feeling yes. for you. We've hidden some poisonous animals around the building as well. <laughs> yeah, just yeah, just yeah. Your eyes peel. Watch, your eyes watch peel. how you get out. Yeah. Uh, but in terms of the market then, and you just said it there, like in ter- your point of difference compared to the bigger manufacturers, of course, everyone's got their place. But what was it like getting into that space? Because whilst there was a gap in the market, absolutely, you're up against these giants with huge budgets and, you know, athletes all around the world who are sponsored. Was it an easy process to sort of start small and then, you know, that word of mouth marketing, which is also important, sort of rely heavily on that? Or do you ever think, right, we really need to go, you know, yes, put a car into the US to launch into the US market, which is easy enough to do for you now, probably wasn't originally, but the business plan for you, getting bigger how was that like, was it a lot of sleepless nights and another year in your room spent still figuring is, out still yeah, 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 good, we're right. still in those moments I mean yeah we had, we had a point of difference which it was a healthier drink and we focus heavily on new topics which you see on the can which are these mm-hmm. cognitive amino acids that help with focus which again was linked to something in sports science I enjoyed how do you focus and how do you improve your mental performance so it was all structured around having a point of difference mm. but again the the big thing is you're going on the same shelf as, as a Red Bull a Monster a Coke's products you're going into the same shelf so you've got to convince someone who's traditionally stocked that for the last 20 years that this is different and people will buy it but it was the right time and I think time is everything even this series it's electric it's, it's about yep. the environment this this is a big topic now yep. which is why this works and I think for us there was a big topic around sugar at the time so the zero sugar thing was big for us everybody could start to read labels I mean you start to read the back end I can't even pronounce that word what is it <laughs> um, and that, that was a big one for us the consumer was starting to look mm. and I was probably that generation into health and fitness the gym has become a massive thing you know, I was there when a couple of friends started you know clothing brands and things in the gym space look at Gymshark now um, that wasn't really a trendy thing at the time now everyone wears leggings so I think it was a, a trendy <laughs> pro- I mean yeah I do no I don't wear leggings <laughs> what do you mean are you wearing right now yeah, yeah, yeah. Tracky, so I love you <laughs> um, but yeah I think it was a, it's a trendy thing now health in, uh, in mental awareness is becoming trendy so we're yep. right on that moment really and why excite? Because uh, the branding looks great, yeah. I have to say, and certainly alongside other products on the shelf, it's going to stand out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why excite? What was the branding discussion like? I know your obviously your rallycross car is incredibly colourful, and it's very Colourful, easy to yeah. pick you in the crowd. <laughs> I think the I had this weird thing, and it's not even from a marketing persuasion or I just wanted something that was four letters I don't know why I just thought (laughs) four letters is ideal it just looks right Um, and then of course you need to have a meaning behind the brand especially an energy drink brand Um, exciting obviously adjective in English it made a load of sense there and trademark law is my biggest hate <laughs> the amount of times you're like this is the idea and then the trademark attorney's like nah well someone else has got that and they've never used it but it's theirs yeah. what do you um, mean McDonald's is trademark yeah. what do you mean they've got energy drinks now? Yeah. Like, I wanted to milk energy <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah and, and obviously luckily the the interesting spelling of this although people don't it also sounds of words can be hmm. so even though I've trademarked XITE if you trademark XITE the actual word I could stop using it because it sounds the same mm. and all this so um, so yeah it was just luck of the draw and then of course you have a few moments where you trademark in the UK then you're like right the business is ready for Europe and someone else has got it in Europe mm. so you've got to check global trademarks and mm. things but yeah it just worked right it was exciting and that's what the brand we wanted to have the look and feel of before we move on to Extreme A, I do want to touch on those rally cross years again that mm. sort of fed into this. Mm. 
as we were already saying, pretty competitive early on. Second season, competed for the Thailand British Rally Cross. Drop point system cost you in the end, 749. Yeah. Is that not the most annoying rule in all I've of motorsport really drop points? I've never really wanted to live this down again. I mean, yeah, I was there my first year. I podiumed seven out of nine events. Mm-hmm. Um, and, yeah, there was basically... You had to drop your two highest scores and all, mm. and all very high averages. So the two I dropped were massive. Yeah. And uh, and um, the Nathan, who beat me that year, yeah, he had... Uh, he had less podiums, but uh, one more first place than me or something. Mm-hmm. That, of course, then he didn't drop um, as good his reins as I did, which put me second in the championship. So, yeah, it was a bit disappointing. It would have been nice to get that, that championship win in my first year. But, uh, yeah, we've seen that recently in Formula 1. Eh? So these, yeah. <laughs> yeah, these things work. But <laughs> yes, it, uh, <laughs> yes. That, that timelines this interview. Does. <laughs> yeah. I'm looking forward to leading oh, the yeah. campaign to drop that points rule from all motorsport. I've yes. never understood a drop points rule. That's just no. my own bugbear. <laughs> I've, I mean, it was tricky for me to understand. And uh, I don't know, there's politics in racing and, um, mm-hmm. you know, the car that he was driving had been in the series for a super long time and mm-hmm. who knows. Yes. I do want to fast forward a little bit now, though, because Extremely pops up on the radar, not all that long after you're sort of really into the thick of, of Rallycross. Mm. We know Extreme is kind of, kind of like Rallycross, really. Yeah, it's a lot of Rallycross drivers like, here, isn't there? Mm. Absolutely. And I think that sort of gives it away. Yeah. But, of course, has this really unique selling proposition including when it sort of popped up it's had a lot of ideas moving around i think what's really interesting is a lot of those ideas have actually come into reality often Mm. you'll get a great idea for a great new sport and by the time it comes out it's actually just something you've seen before not quite the case with extreme e what was it that caught your eye Mm. for this series it was a myriad of things i think timing again it it was that timing point um you know rally cross that i was involved in world rally cross wasn't sure where it was going with the electrification thing um covid at time was all Mm -hmm. a bit here and there still wanted to race obviously competitively at a a high level um and just saw extreme e creeping up and it you know for my brand x site we were starting to get, um, you know, feelings in the market that, um, you know, retailers were looking at brands and who they sponsor and how they do it. And was it right to do traditional marketing still now mm-hmm. with, with petrol cars and things? Or should you be putting some of your marketing spend into something more sustainable, um, like Extreme E? So it was the right move for the brand at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and then me as a driver, I thought, um, you know, it was the first year of Extreme E. Some of the biggest names in the world were doing it. Um, again, probably felt a little bit at my depth. Yep. Um, you know, I had a bit of that imposter syndrome moment again, but just thought, you know, I just need to go for this. I could be one of the first drivers in the series. Uh, that'll do me great from a personal branding point of view, and I can yep. bring Excite along with it and be part of this sustainable movement, um, which has been really cool. It's interesting because a lot of the drivers we've spoken to over the course of the last year of this podcast, you know, they have various reasons for getting involved with Extreme E, but often it's just feels a lot like it's just the next stepping stone and they'll often say of course they support all the values of extreme e logically enough but it's sort of like well you know eventually we're going to have to do this so we may as well go to electric racing it strikes me that you've really still got that marketing brain through this mm. whole thing the idea that you might be getting involved in extreme e because that is a good move for motorsport and a good move as a driver yeah. how much of i guess your outlook now not just as a, an as extreme e driver but future whatever your future yeah. may hold is about the positioning of motorsport because it does feel like we're in a in a moment where things could change very quickly. Do you get that sense? Yeah, no, we definitely are. And I think it's it's almost becoming for me now as Excite maybe gets bigger than me, the athlete. Mm-hmm. It's something I'm probably led more by Excite really. Where, where does Excite go? And I think we're trying to be this innovative beverage on a new end of scale. And I almost see uh, electric motorsport the perfect place for that brand proposition because as motorsport becomes more innovative more sustainable more socially conscious um, if my brand is also doing that in in the energy space they sort of work together perfectly it's almost like now you know and and that's partly why I sponsored the series as well with the drink just because it was that that perfect movement and also a way to say look we're not a normal energy drink we're Mm. not traditional just out there just um, you know sponsor extreme everything but we want to be involved in something this new thinking so yeah it worked perfect timing really what is the the future in this space, do you think? I mean, obviously, electric is the, the next kind of thing in, in motorsport. It's certainly exerting a large influence in motorsport. There are some sectors that won't change and some sectors that reject that change. And, of course, no one knows really where it is going. Yeah. But how important do you think electric motorsport is, a, if you like, a portfolio for drivers to invest in through their, their abilities, through their careers, moving forward? Because it does feel like, again, in the last couple of years, more series are popping up, Extreme E being just one of them. Yeah. Do you think this is going to encroach in traditional motorsport space or is it going to be a case of people having to, to jump ship if you like from com- combustion motorsport 
I think a bit of both, but I think if if you're aspirational in your motorsport career, I think if you want to be, you know, pay to drive, get paid to drive cars, it's going to be electric. And I think, you know, again, maybe this is marketing brain again, but if you look back at manufacturers, what do they want to mm-hmm. sell you? They're going to want to sell you electric cars. So why have a petrol one on a racetrack costing you money? It just wouldn't wouldn't make any sense. Um, and I've been exposed now to electric race cars, but more so even more now electric road cars. And, you know, I drive some electric road cars now, and I get back into the petrol equivalent, so I'm like, this is dead technology. Like, it is old, it is slow. Put your foot down, nothing happens for a few seconds. It's just, like, even for the average, the normal consumer buying these cars, I don't think they're ever going to look back. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think as drivers, the next generation of drivers will grow up in a Tesla, will grow up in an electric something. They won't necessarily know the difference. And indeed, that is so interesting because, again, we talk to you know, we talk to a lot of people generally, including of our age. We're all roughly similar age here. And there's still, you know, you have an ideal of a car and it's often, well, of course it was often petrol because growing up electric cars were not a yeah, thing. Exactly. Mm. And it seems like quite a big boundary to break through to accept that that ideal of a car you had as a child is no, long, no longer should exist. Yeah. In fact, increasingly, you'll see supercar manufacturers are not even making those kind of cars yeah, yeah. anymore. It won't be acceptable to own one, mm. socially, if you know what I mean. Yeah. E- exactly. Do you find that you have to have that, not necessarily an argument, but that discussion with people when you're talking about motorsport or, or, or even road cars, the yeah. idea that... Because, I mean, to be honest, compared to even some of the other drivers we've spoken to, all who are very much on board with electric cars, you may be the most on board with them, I yeah. feel like, we've spoken well, to, I've which is really interesting. That, even myself in the paddock, I've noticed there's a... Especially with racing drivers, they're like, mm. yeah, electric's cool, but it's not the same. Yeah. And you get that sentiment quite a lot, but I think... I don't think it's never going to be the same, is it? But I think you can take all the different attributes from what electric cars offer, you know, the speed, the reliability, the smoothness, especially with road cars and compared to petrol ones, it's no no comparison. Um, And I think it's it's either embracing that movement. I think you're going to have traditional, um, you know, club motorsport that will stay petrol for longer, Mm, but no doubt that will go electric at some point. The the cars will fade out and that will move as well. So I think, you know, it's it's a ride that's going to keep going. Um, So I think you either join it or... Yeah, stay back in the past a bit. <laughs> <laughs> and it almost doesn't matter that it is slightly different. I mean, that's kind of the exciting point, right? It's yeah. from as a motorsport fan, as we all are, you know, in addition to what we're doing here, it's just great to watch something different. Of course, we've seen Rallycross go electric. There's Moto yeah. E, there's Formula E, of course, there's everything. That's all that direction, as you say, is going down that path. But I want to know what you first thought of the Odyssey 21 when you, you know, the first time seeing it first time driving it because uh like we're here we haven't even seen it yet we're recording yeah. the, the Jurassic x pre but uh i'm excited to see it for the yeah. first time talk us through that that for you it was an interesting uh, sort of first event for me i actually went to a test in uh, they were doing a test in france with the car that was it early on i was like just come and drive the car and have a go um and it was raining wet it was a bit like it to be honest <laughs> uh, a bit like england but in france and i went and had a go and i was just amazed at the size of the thing firstly mm. when you see it and you get up close to it it's a big vehicle um it, regardless of driving it and there's a few drivers sort of i could see driving it before i had my go um and just initially the speed you feel from it is quite impressive and i think you feel that in any electric car just the torque the way they move um in the sound like we've just been talking about mm-hmm. there's no sound which is really weird as a driver because i think you don't realize how much you use sound mm-hmm. to understand what's going on with the vehicle mm. i mean then you've got none and there's no tire squeal because we're on mud so it's quite a weird sensation you're sliding around a corner you're like Am I sl- is the wheel sliding who's, who's sliding <laughs> am i in control is it driving like i have no idea what's going on um so yeah it's, it's an interesting experience when, and Christine GZ, obviously your your co-driver, the other driver for Excite Energy Racing, talk to us about that. But were you involved in, I mean, because it's your team and you're sponsoring it and you're yeah. also a driver. So what was the process like for you to try and find the female driver for your yeah, team? Yeah, I mean, we had obviously like a roster of, of, of talent that was coming to us and uh, being sent through agencies and um, yeah, met a few different people, some, you know, all really good drivers in, in different disciplines and stuff. Um, and then, yeah, met Christine in, in Barcelona where she lived. I was there for a week and I said, well, let's just have a coffee um, and hear your story and why you want to do this and yeah we just got on great and her mm. bubbly energy again if you're looking at marketing she was yep. like it's like you've just drank 50 cans of excise <laughs> <laughs> like, if anyone's perfect for excise it's, it's you so I think that that was the decision obviously she had a great motorsport history um, she'd done a lot of Can-Am racing a lot of Bajas mm. in the States which is similar sort of stuff to this um, so you know some of the other uh, girls we, we were talking to at the time was more circuit racing based maybe not quite off-road as much as she was so uh, it's just a perfect fit 
Yeah, she's she's great. We were doing the legacy project this morning uh, out with Beavers, and she'd uh, never worn gumboots or wellies before, and had to <laughs> oh, go and test the out. The discussions about wellies this week. I'm like, <laughs> they're like a nylon tubey foot. Like, <laughs> keep your feet dry. She's like, where where where'd you get these? Yeah. <laughs> it's a big deal. Uh, yeah. It's certainly worth, I'm sure, your socials. Uh, I mean, when you're listening to this podcast, go back to around the Jurassic X pre time yeah. and just watch mm-hmm. her reaction to standing in a bit of water and her feet not getting wet. She was very happy. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's very fun to watch. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah. It is. Yeah. What's it like? Uh, we've asked this question of a couple of drivers, and I think the answer is always interesting. Compromising, coming from forms of motorsport where you don't necessarily have co drivers or sharing drivers, really. Mm. Sometimes you have co drivers, but this is a real sharing situation. Adjusting to the idea that that car does not belong just to you. Yeah, that's tricky, actually, in Extreme E. And I think, um, especially this series, new cars, new circuits, how fast can you drive them without damaging them? Um, how much stick can they take? And, and even in our own team, we've we've had moments where I've pushed the car too much, Christine's pushed it too much, and it hasn't come back. And you're like, damn, mm. I don't get to do it. You know, you don't get mm. to do your lap as such, you know, um, in, in drive. So, yeah, it's, it's a tricky balance. And it has been, I mean, the first season was difficult for a lot of teams, and you've suffered your own share, a fair share, I think it's fair to say, maybe even more, yeah. of bad luck over the course of the season. Yeah. How do you, I guess, as the season progressed in particular, or even from the beginning of the season, knowing it was brand new, testing time is very limited in Extreme E as well by nature, the way the series is run. Getting to grips with that car and then knowing often your obsessions were curtailed for technical problems, you suffered a fair few of them. How difficult was that getting through the season knowing you're missing a lot of seat time? Yeah, tricky for us as well. I guess me and Christine, have, we have less experience as drivers. We're quite, I'm quite new into the to this especially and so is she. So I think for us, every lap we didn't do was was quite monumental in our sort of performance um, in, in sort of how it would affect us as a team. So yeah, that sort of luck started to almost curtail more bad luck I think um, because you do less laps you make more mistakes different things like this and it it was one of those things where um, it was sort of a spiralling situation I guess Um, and difficult difficult sometimes at some events um, especially Christine wears her heart on her sleeve so you can tell when she's she's annoyed trust me (laughs) so uh, so yeah it's been uh, something to balance I guess How's it been like, though? Because it hasn't been the best of beginning seasons for you guys, it's fair to say. And when something goes wrong with a car or you push it too hard or something else happens, what's it like when you're sitting in the driver's seat and you know that that's it and you're done yes. for the whole? Because you've travelled, of course, for the event and yeah. something's happened. It must be very hard to really frustrating. pick yourself up. Yeah, really frustrating. I think, yeah, pick yourself up is that is, I guess, the thing that is very tricky. Um, and it's something I've always, I'm always just quite a positive guy. You always sort of just get on with it, I think. So try to have that attitude with this as well, which has gone a long way. But it's not easy. I know you, you come a long way. We fly a long way. There's a lot of travel, a lot of time involved in these events, which um, I try and balance between my work life and, and obviously doing this. So, yeah, to go a long way and maybe do a lap or two is, is difficult. Um, and you come away thinking, damn, that was a lot of time and effort and mm-hmm. money and resources um, to do that. So, yeah, it's, it's not been easy. Um, and, and, and hopefully, you know, as the seasons progress, it gets a bit easier with the teams, a bit more reliability and things like that. And it feels like this championship is very friendly. Uh, <laughs> it's certainly walking around and, and chatting to some of the drivers and the drivers are chatting themselves because obviously there's five events for this year. Uh, and there's a lot of time in between those events and there's, you know, the catching up on what everyone else has been doing. Compared to other series that you've been in, is that a real, like a big difference, a big point of difference for you? Of course, there's the legacy program and you know the, the awareness to climate change and sustainability and this diversity, of course. But it just seems like everyone's, here for the right reasons and is just bloody happy to be here yeah <laughs> no it's very different and you know I sometimes notice the first event it, it rally across probably your other motorsports you go to you do get that if you look in my garage what you're looking at sort of vibe mm-hmm. which you don't get here at all you can walk into people's garages like I said talk to anyone and I think there's a few reasons why one we're all here I think we all feel like we're here to race but we're also here sort of on our own legacy mm. trying to do our own good trying to you know make our own audience of aware of what is going on with the climate change um, and of course there's the the more practical things like the first first event in Sydney you're stuck on a boat together you share rooms <laughs> with everyone <laughs> yeah. and you can't be too pissed off about the result the week before because you've got to share a bunk bed with them so you sort of um, I sort of I think it just reduces the barriers between the teams and the drivers and you all sort of feel like you're on this big voyage together I want to talk about that greater purpose as well we've talked about already the electrification of motorsport which I think is in its own right a discussion because it's just going to be something that happens but the greater good purpose of it I think is interesting that is of course a key pillar of extreme e, environmental and even social justice all of that kind of thing for motorsport I find it's interesting because it in some sense it has a worse reputation than it deserves because obviously it is for the most part excluding the electric series 
you know, people burning petrol for an entire weekend. Yeah. The logistics is often much worse than, than the form of motorsport itself. But how important is it for, for thing, something like motorsport, and this probably applies for all sports, to have a social license now? We've sort of touched on that idea that, you know, things are, are changing. Yeah. Do you think that if we don't change fast enough in a way that has a greater good beyond just motorsport's own continuing existence, then things like motorsport may not even have a place in a new world, if you like? 100%. And, and I think coming from the business side of this, and in motorsport, ultimately, what is it? It is a business. We're an entertainment mm -hmm. business. And this entertainment business here is about racing, off-road and showcasing climate change. But I think all businesses now have a social responsibility and that will come down to the sporting side. Um, like I said with Exile, we've got to you know, be aware of the carbon footprint of our drinks. What do mm -hmm. they take to produce the drink and ship it around the world? And how do we offset that carbon? Uh, and I think sporting regulations will have that, whether it's football, players going on private or, uh, you know, race cars being taken around the world to race. I guess why are they going and, and how are they trying to offset that that problem and bring benefit? And I think the viewers and the audiences and the consumers of these types of media or product and things, I think they're going to become much more aware of what brands are doing the right thing. Um, and then when the consumer choose, you know, the business soon, soon comes out on top, which one's doing it. So, yeah, I think it's going to be a big change. We had five rounds in 2021. I might knock off the UK as an option considering you're from these parts, but you can choose it if you like. There's been a lot of mud at the Jurassic x -ray. What has impacted you most over the, the course of the five rounds? Because we've seen five quite spectacular uh, environments all showcasing different climate challenges and, of course, the legacy programs as well, these positive impact things. Yeah. What have you been most impacted by by what you've seen? I think, and it's probably an easy one to choose just because it's so visual, but it's probably Greenland. Mm -hmm. um, and I think probably more so on, on the, the journey home when we flew out of the airport there in Greenland um, to make our way back to the UK, you could see the amount of ice that is, is just gone. Mm -hmm. And it's vast amounts. And I think some of the st stats they were talking like 10, 20 metres a day of like mile, mile long ice sheets were just being melted. Um, and it's one to easily visualise, I think. But there's been many instances, I think, in, in, in Senegal with the plastic, um, it was just crazy how much plastic there was actually everywhere um, in, in, in the environment and there was pictures of animals eating it and getting stuck in it and all, all sorts of things so there's been a few but um, you know, it's been eye opening to see really You've learned a lot obviously from the scientific community as part of Extreme E as well and we've spoken of course to many people on this podcast about what you can do at home from your point of view and because I, I know sometimes it can be quite overwhelming the climate crisis and you know this bigger thing COP26 of course has just happened do you have any advice for people that might be listening that have decided, okay, well, today is the day that I'm going to be doing this? Of course, there's the Count Us In challenge that uh, you can get behind Excite Energy Racing to do as well. Is there something, though, that you think is easy enough for everyone to do that can listen, listen to this podcast almost immediately that will start making a real difference? Yeah, no, it's a good question because I think sometimes you can see the headlines and all feel a bit helpless by all of mm. this. And it was something we raised with the scientists early doors. We were like, this is all fine, but what can we actually do? And I think it's surprising what you can do as individuals is it's that pair of three thing where you don't really feel like you're making an impact but actually you add us all together it's it's huge and all together we make up the planet not just individual businesses or, or people i guess so i think i think you can always find something in your own life me for me personally it was plastic consumption i'm on the go all the time convenience is quite important to me mm. um but you know i was just starting to look in you know my car and rubbish bags like i had like three bottles of water today like two sandwiches and all that I'm like I could probably make a sandwich and just take it and mm -hmm. I could probably just buy a stainless steel water bottle mm -hmm. and that's three three or four bits of plastic a day from me personally that are not going wherever they end up so I think there's things you can look at and obviously we're all being pushed into electric cars now that'll be the next one which is, is quite an easy move so yeah there's lots you can do I think can you imagine being involved now in a in a main job you have many jobs on the go obviously aside <laughs> from just racing so you can pick any one of them yeah. Without considering that idea, I know we've talked about that social license, but even speaking to some people in Extreme E and in other sports, in fact, in fact, people who have transitioned from Extreme E and also work in other things in particular find that when they go back to whatever it is, it's sometimes hard to justify what they do without feeling like they're at least contributing to something broader. Mm. That seemed like it was a little bit part of your life even before you arrived in Extreme yeah, yeah. A, particularly in developing Excite Energy. But can you imagine now moving on to a business project without 
that thought in your mind? Is that just the way yeah. people need to think now? I, th- I think so. And I think it's going to be so subconscious you won't notice. I mm. mean, me and my girlfriend, we were out for some dinner the other night. We both we, been, we noticed we both had like vegetarian options. I was sat there thinking like, why have we both chose that? It's not like I don't, I'm yeah. against eating meat, obviously. I, but then there's the awareness of reducing your meat consumption um, and the effects it has on the environment and different things. So I think subconsciously we're all going to start making little changes and over time they'll build up. Um, and I think businesses will make fundamental big changes now for, for consumers humorous and we'll all get used to the idea that things need to change we're entering into a new year 2022 what can we expect for ollie bennett in 22 there's lots going on for me it's an awful <laughs> lot from the business side obviously um you know america's going to be quite big for us i'm racing over there um there's some more electric motorsport i'm going to end up doing that, that isn't extremely which i'm really excited about and obviously there, there's potential to doing this again next year um which is is soon around the corner so yeah there's a lot going on uh, but time again you, mm. there's only so much time so. <laughs> in terms in terms of being able to find excite as a drink where can especially in the us i suppose because you're about to launch yeah. where can people find you I mean, the easiest place is if you order directly online from us, you can get it shipped to your house, which pandemic has made everyone shop online. Yes. Um, so yep. you, see that you end up saying that now. No excuses. No excuses, <laughs> exactly. But no, we're in um, Holland and Barrett, um, Ocado, different shops like that, sports shops. We're actually launching in three UK retailers uh, in 2022. So you should be able to almost go anywhere and get us. But if not, go online. So much you've got going on. It's going to be a big year, 2022. Same 365 days, though. Unless it's a leap year. Is it a leap no, year? No, that was this year. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Quickly Good. check. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to make sure. Yeah. Uh, look, it's been great to chat with you. Absolutely. All the best with everything you're doing in 2022. Yeah, and hopefully we'll chat again soon. Yeah, definitely. Enjoyed it. Well, a massive thank you to Ollie Bennett from Excite Energy Racing. Fantastic to chat with him in Dorset at the Jurassic X Pre. But stick around for this podcast because the best is yet to come in 2022. We have you covered all the way until Saudi Arabia, the first X Pre of this year and the second season, of course. We know just a fabulous ending to the first season and what is the second season going to bring. If you're listening to us on Apple Podcasts, please consider leaving us a rating and review. And of course, you can subscribe to wherever you're listening to this podcast on any app. Make sure also you subscribe to Extreme E on their official YouTube channel and all of their socials, including TikTok. We can't wait to chat in another couple of weeks again with an Excite Energy Racing driver. It's Christine GZ, an absolutely fantastic chat that you won't want to miss. But it's time to say goodbye. We will see you in a couple of weeks. Music.